You are watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. It's time to see what's making the headlines with PR consultant Alex Dean and Guardian columnist Zoe Williams. They'll be with us from now until just before midnight. So let's see what's on the front pages for you now. Well, Houthis on the warpath. That's the lead story in The Times, which says that Houthi rebels in Yemen are threatening retaliatory attacks for the airstrikes last night by UK and US forces. The Express says that Rishi Sunak now wants Iran's Revolutionary Guard declared a terrorist organisation to protect the UK because Iran is backing the Houthis. The Telegraph carries calls from Defence Secretary Grant Shapps for Tehran to call off what he describes as the Houthi thugs attacking shipping in the Red Sea. The Eye leads with former Prime Minister Lord Cameron's role in the airstrikes, saying that just two months after returning to government as Foreign Secretary, he's at the helm of the decision-making and presented the attack plan to Cabinet last night. While the Mirror leads with what it calls the high price we're paying for the Red Sea conflict, increased risk of terror attacks here and soaring costs of shipping and the goods they bring. The Mail has seen documents which tell the story of the moment of the Queen's death in 2022, with a memo which says she simply slipped away. The Financial Times says the post office could face a bill of £100 million if compensation payments already made to victims of the Horizon scandal are deemed unlawful. That's because it got tax relief on them. And finally, The Star has a story about what it calls alien babies, mummified eggs found in Mexico, which nobody knows the earthly origin of. Hmm. A uh, reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us. And we are joined tonight by PR consultant Alex Dean and The Guardian's Zoe Williams. Welcome Hello. to you Hi. both. Happy New Year. First Happy time New Year. You this year. Uh, let's start with uh, The Eye. And their headline, Cameron played key role in UK bombing Yemen rebels. Uh, you would expect that, as he is the Foreign Secretary. So. It's, it's super strange, this story, because they're, they're making it sound like just two months into the job, he's made this major decision. But, like, what were they going to do? Give him, you know, stabilisers yeah. first. I don't... I feel like there's something else they're sort of saying. I feel like they're sort of saying it, it was... They're, they're trying to kind of... Re it's a reassuring story that it's not just it wasn't just a US decision which the which the Sunak administration was balanced into. Is there a suggestion that that perhaps Lord Cameron is is warmongering? Is that the underlying message from this I, story? I don't. I don't. I can't believe. Who would think Cameron had the energy to warmonger? Well, our foreign secretary should be involved in a decision <laughs> like this, right? So it's a strange head face, uh, front page on the face of it. But whilst it's a new current conflict, it's not an old. It's not a new issue. It's a. It's a relatively um, long-standing problem in the region. And interestingly, if this is what the eye is getting, let's be generous to them. If this is what the eye is getting at, when they had their September Revolution to its fans, or the uprising Houthi takeover to its critics, was when Cameron was Prime Minister in 2014. So he's actually been round this block before. Yeah. And I imagine this issue has crossed his desk before. I actually don't think that's what they're getting at. Here. I think yeah. they're saying, we don't like David Cameron, he's involved in this action. But you don't seriously think that they're... I don't even think they're implying that he kind of decided it on behalf of Sunak. No, but... Well, are they suggesting that, that he is taking the lead because he has been Prime Minister before right. and he's had experience with this... This week. But either the Foreign Secretary or the Defence Secretary would. So yeah, I just think, well, exactly. just think, I just think exactly. it's a bit and of a non story. You're not going to give page. it to Grant Shapps, are you? No, and, and it's, you know, the Prime Minister doesn't take this to the Cabinet himself because ultimately he's going to preside over a discussion on it. Yeah. It's always the Foreign Secretary or the Defence Secretary who, who does. And uh, f to my mind, this action is, is richly warranted, uh, not least because of the conversations your colleagues have been covering about the impact on civil and commercial shipping uh, in this environment. So completely against international law to use in international waters weapons of, of military um, capability against civilian and commercial um, boats, ships. Uh, and so the countries that have taken this action, it seems to me, have done the right thing, whether it was David Cameron who told them to or not. Yeah, I also looking at the... Uh, well, they're quoting the ex-military chief and fears of a, an escalation. 
Well, I mean, this is, anybody who isn't worried about an escalation is crazy, frankly. But like, what, whatever. Obviously, international law is actually pretty clear on threats to shipping. Yeah. But equally, the, the you know the the intense care and many would argue over caution around the Israel Gaza conflict and the fact that you know Biden had Biden's sort of calling for restraint while at the same time as supporting it, it does, it, all of that has partly been informed by a desire not to see an escalation. And this is, you know, this is making escalation more rather than less likely. Uh, and of course, escalation can mean different things. It can mean more violence or it can mean more participants in that violence. Well, yeah, and... but when you, the more participants you have, the more violence there tends to be. Oh, no, I, I'm not necessarily saying uh, those things are good. I'm saying that, yeah. you, that it can mean more than one thing. And interestingly, of course, whilst Britain and America have taken part in this action, countries like Italy and France thus far have not. And part of the reason for that is that, of course, Yemen is still a sovereign country. Yeah. You know, the, the clues in the name, Houthi rebels are not the official government in, in Yemen. The, the part party we haven't heard from yet in this conflict is the official government of Yemen, of Yemen yeah. right? And if they say, please help us against the Houthi rebels, now you understand, the international community, what we're dealing with. Now you understand the challenges we're facing. Come and help us. That will... I mean, Italy has overtly said, we won't get involved until we're asked by a sovereign state member of the United Nations to intervene to help them. The French are slightly sitting on the fence more, even though they've got ships deployed in region, right? But you can see more participants becoming involved quite quickly if the Yemeni government government um, asks them to. The, the Times looking a bit more at the mm. detail of, of the attack and uh, the, the fact here that the Cabinet weren't privy to the actual timing of, of the strike, although there was that, that meeting, that call, uh, Cabinet call uh, with uh, Rishi Sunak and Lord Cameron, they actually didn't know when it was about to happen. And the, and the Times very much portrays that as a kind of um, matter of military importance. You know, the Cabinet couldn't know because the, the, the operation was sensitive. But I'm... I, I, it, it doesn't... It strikes me as extremely surprising that there was so little advance notice to the Cabinet and so little advance notice to Parliament, actually. You know, there's a, there's a discussion around whether it should have gone to a vote before it happened. I am agnostic on that because I think Labour probably would have voted with them anyway. But it, it, it is, it, it's kind of un, it's unusual to have so little known ahead. I mean, you wouldn't have seen that in 2018. Well, I get the point about Parliament not being involved. I think I mean, that's a question of judgment and whether what one thinks about um, these issues and whether the, the executive has the ability to mount these operations, especially in, in critical times. Well, they but have I, the I get right, your point about right? they have the right, yeah. but I get the point about whether Parliament should have been involved earlier or in, in, a, in a fuller basis. Mm -hmm. Where we may disagree, I mean, and this is not a party political point, I can't think of the last cabinet that didn't leak. I can't think of a cabinet of Labour, coalition, or Conservative where details weren't promptly uh, released. And if I were, well, heaven, yeah, heaven forbid, I know. Oh, come on, thirteen years when when there was a Labour, when Tony Blair's cabinet were sitting, they didn't leak. They some, sometimes that's because you know, Tony Blair was famous for having armchair, uh, setting sofa government and never making decisions in cabinet. No, he made yeah. he made more decisions in cabinet than go on with this lot. I mean, you know, you have got a very dishevelled political class at the moment, and I agree with you that, 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 that it is as leaky as a sieve, but I'm not, yeah. not going to take that's politics People for you. That is surely the one, of the, one of the reasons for not going to, to Parliament um, prior to the decision being taken would be timing. Time well, one, one timing and two, not wanting to warn your enemies. Is there's a very narrow band of activity in which it is honourable to lie to the House of Commons, or at least not to be, uh, give full disclosure. Yeah. And one of them is when you have troops in theatre about to take um, part in action. And whilst a, a Secretary of State didn't have to uh, tell a lie, um, they weren't present to disclose what was going on uh, because the operation was going to happen very quickly and Parliament wasn't told in, a, in enough time to have mm -hmm. a discussion or a debate about it. And that seems to me with an action like this actually to be sensible. But I get that people would disagree. Mm. Let's turn to the Telegraph and uh, Grant Schnapp, the Defence Secretary, um, ordering Tehran to call off Houthi thugs. Uh, that's his warning. Uh, patience is running out. I mean, the thing is, with I'm surprised that Shaps is being quite so pugnacious on this because the US are being much, much more tactful about about the links between Iran and and the Houthi rebels. They're, they're, they're really, really trying not to make explicit whether or not. Although President Biden has said uh, this evening, in fact, that Iran does not want a war 
with the US. Well, yeah. No, no, no. But, I mean, he, ha but he, he said that that administration has said today, or certainly according to The Telegraph, would have been, like, the middle of today, <laughs> that um, they, they are not prepared to make a, an overt connection between Iran and the Houthis. But he has well, by mentioning He has. Them, he? he has. And there is. I, I would say something different to that, that the, it's not just that Iran is um, pulling the strings with the Houthis. This isn't a, a situation of black and white and goodies and, and baddies. The Yemeni government in exile, um, and look, they control Aden in the south of Yemen, but many of them live in Saudi Arabia, are controlled by the Saudis. So this is a Saudi versus Iran proxy activity being played out, and now one side's got the Americans and the British to do uh, some bombing for them. No, That's the most cynical interpretation you can have, but there's a bit of truth to that. No, I mean, the, 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 you know, the, the American position is they're really cleaving to the line that this is not an attack on Iran. So they have to maintain that separation between Iran and the Houthis. Right. They're really cleaving to I it. I think President Biden's overtaken reason. you on this. I think President Biden said that there, there, there is a connection and Iran shouldn't want to push it any further. Well, he's also said this is not an attack on Iran, right? Sure. And, that's, and, and that has to be the underpinning of all the conversations. And I think Grant Chaps is being a little bit foolhardy. Literally and technically, it isn't an attack on Iran, but it's definitely an attack on <laughs> yeah. Iranian proxy. Well... That's Let's quickly look at the mirror and the uh, toll on the economy, the high price of the, the conflict and how it will affect, uh, well, UK population. I mean, th there is no such thing as a, as a conflict that doesn't affect the cost of living, right? If it, if it, it either affects the oil prices or it affects shipping or it affects the things you buy from ships or it affects... I mean, it, it's absolutely kind of clear that... This isn't going to make anything any cheaper anytime soon. And I think that is a really dispiriting thing, especially since inflation was coming down briefly and now looks like it's going to bounce back up. And um, fuel prices are, of course, coming down. The energy prices are coming down. The, 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 problem, the problem is, and, and here I do have some sympathy with your point of view, the, 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 the shipping was disrupted anyway and it was already cost... And it's partly to, it's partly to protect the, um, the kind of cost of that trade that these strikes have been launched in the first place. Something, <laughs> something's universal about conflict, some things aren't. Well, you know, conflict is, of course, bad. No man is an island. We lament violence. And um, you can get escalation in places that people had to look up in an atlas uh, the day uh, that something happened. Some things are specific, and in this case, there is more shipping going through the Red Sea than almost anywhere else. People thinking they're just in time, delivery model, ordering something uh, online, that it just pops into their house. Actually, most of the time, it comes on a container, and that container is taken on a ship, and that ship has gone through this sea. Indeed. <laughs> Alex and Zoe, thank you very much. Welcome back. You are watching the press preview. Still with me, PR consultant Alex Dean and Guardian columnist Zoe Williams. Let's take a look at this story in the uh, FT weekend uh, regarding the post office uh, and not to do with the, the inquiry necessarily, but uh, a spin-off story about uh, the post office uh, risking a £100 million bill. Explain the detail to this, Alex. People are going to be surprised to hear that when the post office paid compensations to victims of their Horizon scheme, they claimed tax relief on the money that they shelled out. It is natural... I mean, it, it wouldn't occur to most of us, but I suppose when you have to spend that much money in compensation for what you've done wrong, it occurs to people's accountants and tax advisors well, from time Well, you to can time claim relief on fines you and can, such like. Can you? Can you claim relief on parking fines? Uh, oh, I don't know. I'm all, I, and of course, <laughs> any advice given out on the show is not by the discussion. No, no I, don't think, I don't think that you can. Um, but the, the point here, I think, is that most people would think that when you have to pay somebody for something you've done wrong, mm. it's a sign of your culpability and you shouldn't get a, a, an offset from the tax man for that. And indeed, there is now an investigation into what they've done as a, a result of that. And if it's ruled that they've behaved unlawfully, it could go as far as driving the post office into insolvency. That's why the story is so important. That's a huge story. And yet, when they actually claimed the tax relief on this bill, they it was already known that they that the mistake was theirs, right? So, how has the you know all that's really changed? I think it's a bit like the why the issues bubbled up in the first place. Suddenly, there's a great deal more attention on it. Right, right. right? It's not the case that people weren't entitled, shouldn't have received compensation two months ago, uh, any more than they do now, uh, less than they do now. It's it's not the case that the, the, the post office had done something less wrong two months ago. It's that recent events and a, a four part hard hitting drama has <laughs> driven this way up the agenda, and now everyone's talking about. No, it. I know, but tax look tax accountants 
accountants, especially government tax accountants, do not make their decisions based on Alan Bates versus the post office, no, right? No. So, but, but just to, to get the, the factual detail correct, experts uh, say the matter is not clear cut. Uh, a business can generally claim tax deductions for expenses incurred that are closely connected with its trade, even if this is a compensation payment. Maybe it, it maybe it is just the you know the social understanding of just how much they lied means yeah, that it's completely untenable for no, them to have claimed tax it, relief. On exactly, that. because your your point is well, it's a grey area. Sometimes tax advisors say it's okay, some tax advisors don't. It's a bit it's a bit like that discussion. For years, people were taxed had to had to got a um, a chunk taken off their compensation for uh, for food and lodging if they'd been wrongly convicted and then it, yeah, it yeah, exploded yeah. Yeah, over that, that one that, case and then yeah, suddenly yeah. everyone agreed that it was wrong yes. it feels to me like this is like that a we pinball machine see. on tilt we shall see very interesting uh just about 30 seconds uh so in this story in the times I... um and we're predicting that this is going to I'm cause so, huge I'm, problems with neighbours. I'm so excited Explain. about this. Michael excited. Gove... Yeah, I'm so excited just to see all the fighting. <laughs> I, thought, I thought low traffic neighbourhoods was as good as it got, but this is going to go wild. Basically, Michael Gove has said that if you want to um, put an extension on your house rather than use existing planning reg um, legislation and apply for planning permission, you c it can be put to referendum in your local community. <laughs> Because that goes well. Um, and the, these extensions could be possibly as, as tall as seven storeys. So you could put a seven storey extension on your house so long as your neighbours agree to it in a referendum. Can't see this ending uh, well. Anyway, we've left it there. Discuss. Uh, Alex and Zoe, thank you very much for the moment. Let's